you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. The Chris Voss Show. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Uh, 14 years and the 1400 episodes of the Chris Voss show. We're putting up two to three a day. Make sure you're checking out everything we're doing. We've got a great American hero who's going to be on the show today talking about his life and what he experienced in life and endurance and perseverance. Uh, but in the meantime, as always, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Spread the word, spread the love, spread the intelligence, make the world smarter and better. Tell people to go to youtube.com, fortress Chris Voss, goodreads.com, fortress Chris Voss, linkedin.com, fortress Chris Voss. And for the love of God, follow us and support us on twitter we're trying to be cool but we're old and fat and ugly and they just don't like us over there yet but we're working on it we're trying to do it so support us over there as well uh we have an amazing gentleman on the show with us today and i think you're gonna be inspired motivated and uh you're gonna just go uh, totally next level at just uh appreciating life and uh getting inspiration from others he is the author of the latest book this comes out july 4th 2023, which I believe is an American holiday, if I recall rightly. Um, the title of the book is called A Patriot's Promise, Protecting My Brothers, Fighting for My Life, and Keeping My Word. Senior Master Sergeant, retired now, Israel D.T. Del Toro Jr. joins us on the show today. We'll be talking about his amazing book. He was a senior master sergeant of the Air Force. He served in Afghanistan as a special ops paratrooper. He was injured in action in 2005, and his long recovery included adaptive sports as well as advocacy for his fellow wounded warriors. He was instrumental in the creation of the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program, and in 2010, uh, he was the first completely disabled airmen at 100% to re-enlist. I think you have to be allowed to re-enlist in the Air Force. He's a recipient of the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star, and the Pat Tillman Award for Courage at the ESP Wise. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Israel. How are you? Doing good, Chris. Thank you for having me on here. And thank you for coming. It's an honor to have you, sir. And I think you want me to refer you as DT through the show, correct? Yeah, DT's fine. There you go. Oh, we're going to get all nice and friendly here. Uh, so give us a .com or wherever you want people to find you on the interwebs to get to know more about you. Uh, well, I have my, my website, which is uh, deltorostrong.com, and then I obviously have my Instagram, which is IDT21, and then my Facebook page, which is Israel Del Toro Jr. Uh, and I think that that's about it. Uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm still learning to be the whole social media guy. You yeah. know? I was like, I'm just not one that like, here's my breakfast. I ate this morning photo. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. People are like, Hey, here's my scrambled eggs. You're like, we're all having scrambled eggs. <laughs> like, right. oh, oh, you got two extra bacon there. I see that. Yeah, there you go. Well, that's definitely, I'm liking that. Uh, so what motivated you, sir? Do you want to write this book? Well, honestly, Chris, uh, for years, uh, people have asked me to do this. Uh, like what, when I got injured and then when I started, uh, my recovery started to kind of speak, tell my story. Uh, what happened, I want to say around 2009, is 2008 to 2009, everyone started starting to tell you need, a, you need to write a book. And I was like, why would I want to write a book? It's like, I don't even like reading. I was like, you want me to write one? And then, you know, at the time I was just like, you know, 30 something. And I was like, I got so many, you know, adventures to do. Why would, you know, let me live a little bit before I wrote a book. You know, for, like, for some reason, I just thought anyone who wrote a book was like anciently old and, you know. Wow. No one really. young, young ever wrote a book, you know. So, and so, but then, you know, I retired 2019 and I was still speaking, but then COVID hit mm -hmm. and all my speeches were canceled. And I was like, well, I don't got nothing to do now. I was like, I guess let me try this book thing. Everyone keeps telling me that I should be doing it. 
There you go. And is that a husky or a shibu uh, that I see in your background there? Uh, an Akita. An Akita. There you go. I yeah. have two huskies, and so I'm used. To, I saw the curly tail in the back. <laughs> and I'm like, that's in the family somewhere. But so you know, if that was an, a husky, you'd be hearing howling right now. That's probably true. <laughs> that's probably true. Minor, uh, minor. Just I don't know. They're asleep right now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> In the morning, I get a lot of that. So uh, give us a 30,000 overview of the book, uh, Patriot's Promise. So the Patriot's Promise, what it's really based on is a promise I made to my dad uh, the night before he passed. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was 12 years old. And just as like the last thing my dad told me was promise to you always take care of your family. Wow. And, you know, for a 12 year old kid, it's like, okay, yeah, right, dad, whatever. Uh, not to, not expecting that the next day you're coming home from school and you have two of your older cousins there waiting for you and telling your mom that your dad had passed. So, you know, that obviously that promise first included my, my mom and brother and sisters, but then after my mom, when my mom passed a year and a half later, my brother and sisters, and then it started evolving to my teammates being in the military. And then when I got wounded, you know, uh, being an advocate for all the wounded guys out there. And then, to anyone that really had a bad day or needed, uh, you know, someone to have a voice for them, I just kept honoring that promise. And that promise really pretty much shaped who I am, you know, that, that advice my dad gave me back when I was 12 years old. And, and it, helped, it helped me through a couple of my, my struggles because, you know, in the book you read about how I went through some of these struggles, these obstacles, and thinking, why is this happening to me? And, and always going back to remember that promise that you made to your dad. And because honestly, my dad, that, you know, my dad was my hero and it's ironic, you know, yesterday was father's day and, and yeah, just yesterday and, and being able to, to keep that. And, you know, I, more, if anything, this book is more like a kind of like an homage to my dad to people know who he was and how those simple words to a 12 year old kid shaped them and mm -hmm. kept them going through those dark times. But, but it also talks about, you know, me, I, me not doing it on my own, me all throughout my journey, having people there by my side, because I always think you can't do it on your own. And, and, and that's what I did from, you know, my darkest hour, obviously, when you read, you know, having there and, you know, when I got hurt, my, you know, the medic helping me, you know, stay awake, you know, to, you know, having a bad time in, in the hospital and hating the night and having the nurses being there for me. There you go. You know, there's, there's an old axiom, a man's word is his bond, or a man, he's, a man is only as good as his word that's his bond or something to that effect. And we used to kind of live in that society where, you know, everyone did it, things on handshake and people's word actually meant something. So it's interesting to me, you know, I know that in the military is the band of brothers sort of concept. You know, I've had friends in the military and, you know, they, they love being in it because they always know they've, someone's got their back and they can rely on people and there's loyalty and brotherhood and stuff. And uh, it, it's harder to find in public life yeah. out here. Yeah, and it is, you know, you know, the thing that we miss the most, like, especially once we retire or, or separate, isn't all the, the BS sometimes we go through, you know, the red tape and, you know, but it's that brotherhood, that camaraderie where, you just don't find it anywhere. And, you know, the closest I may or came to it was being on a sports team, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that that bond, knowing that we don't care where you came from, who you are, what you did, if you, we know that you're going to do, you're going to be the best of that mission and you're going to have my back. That's all that mattered to us. And and, and that's what we miss a lot, you know. I know I, I, I still do, you know. You know, like luckily being out here at, in Colorado Springs, you know, there's still – couple of my military friends that will travel through here and we'll meet up. And of course my wife tells me, please don't get drunk and get thrown into jail. You know, <laughs> that, that's her biggest fear. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I was like, why don't you say that when I hang out with like my regular friends that aren't military or my, or aren't my tech brothers? Like, cause, cause I know you guys when you get together. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, there's uh, yeah, that's what guys do. That's what we, and plus it's, uh, yeah, you just said you're in Denver. 
Uh, Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs. That's the that's where the Great Academy is for the airport, isn't it? Yeah, the Air Force. Air yeah. Force. Yeah. Uh, beautiful facility out there. I remember going through there and like, wow, that's that's amazing there. Um, so give us a little bit of your origin story. What shaped you growing up? What made you want to get in the uh, Air Force and the military and and all that uh, stuff? Well, well, it's funny, you know, me growing up, uh, you know, on the south side of Chicago, uh, one of the suburbs out there uh, on the bad side of town. You know, I never thought I would be in the military. You know, all I, I thought was, you know, go to school, you know, get a good job, you know, and, you know, kind of grew up like a normal kid. And But no one expected, you know, in a year and a half, you know, you're going to end up losing both your parents. So wow. I was, you know, you, you know, I, I, I honored that promise and helped raise my brothers and sisters. And because people ask me, DT, why did you join? You know, did you mm-hmm. come from, like you said, did you come from, you know, from a long lineage of military or, or duty to serve? And I'm like, that was the last person you would think that would want to join the military. You know, I remember teasing my friends. I was like, why did you, why did you join the devil? <laughs> you know, you know, a freaking 18, 19 year old. I was like, no one's thinking join the military, at least in my area. And then, like I said, I was, I want to say about 22 years old and I saw a commercial and I had a real good job making good money, but it, I just felt like I wasn't being challenged. Like I just, mm-hmm. something was missing. And, and I saw a commercial. I was like, huh, why not? There you go. Was uh, it those famous old, uh, military commercials? I think we both probably grew up <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, I obviously I asked, like, I had friends that had joined and I asked them, hey, what, what branch should I go to? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, I had Army, Navy, Marines friends. Uh, they didn't have any uh, Space Force friends because that was still in the galaxy far, far away. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they all said, Air Force, man, go Air Force. I'm like, why? And they're like, dude, they, they're the best at taking care of the people. Mm-hmm. You know, they have the best facilities. But the most important thing, dude, they have the hottest chicks. Oh, so, so wow. I'm like, all right. I was like, you, you convinced me, <laughs> you know, two right years old. Chris next week. <laughs> Chris be enlisted. I'm still like, single, man. I'm, <laughs> I'll get a phone call from Chief Sam. Like, Sarno Toro, because of your podcast, we've got an increase of recruits all of a sudden. <laughs> Hopefully you get an affiliate fee for that uh, referral. Uh, so you, you joined the Air Force. Were you interested in flying planes or just? anything in the air force no you know i i grew up in the era of rambo mm. you know who, who didn't want to be that long haired chisel body guy <laughs> you know obviously i don't have the the long hair anymore or, or the the chisel bod because my son says i have a dad bod but you know it's all right but at the time put him up for adoption <laughs> I, I wanted i wanted to do that i wanted to i wanted to be that guy yeah. That's what I grew up on. Uh, and so when I enlisted and uh, the Tech P uh, recruiter came by and told me what my job would do about calling an airstrike, jump out of planes, mm-hmm. you know, you will be the man on the ground. You know, I was like, that's the job I want. And, With and the I, hottest chicks, too. Uh, yeah. Right? Because okay. yeah, I, I remember him, you know, I, I swear when he walked in, he had a stogie. You know, he had his bray on, you know, his boots all shiny. And I was like, this guy is Rambo. And he gives, a, like I said, gives the whole spiel. And then he ends it with, but gentlemen, you know what's the best thing about being a tech P? You know, <laughs> it's like, what, Sergeant? See this black bray I have on? Yes. It helps me pick up girls. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like a sign. I was like, I, I, this is the career. Uh, but again, you know, it, it, not taking away from any careers out there, they're all important, you know. Yeah. But uh, but I wanted to be that guy when I'm it, a crusty old grandpa, and my grandchildren asked me, "Grandpa, what you do in the military?" You know, I want to have that. Well, I already kind of have that raspy voice now. I was like, I killed a lot of mofo's when I was in the military. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to be that guy, you know. There you go. And we had Captain Crozier uh, on earlier uh, for his book, Surf Away You Can, and uh, last week, I think. And uh, he said that Top Gun was the thing that got him into the Air Force. <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> People don't realize how little things like that, you know, because again, and I remember me telling a story about getting in because, you know, watching Rambo, and it was like to middle schoolers. 
then I stopped myself. I was like, hold on. How many of you kids know who Rambo is? And like four of them raised their hand. And I'm like, your parents have robbed you from a great childhood. <laughs> I remember the first, uh, what was it? The first, the first movie wasn't called Rambo, right? It was called, uh, first blood, first blood. What a movie. Holy crap. And then the Rambo's thereafter. Yeah. So, uh, there you go. So you, you end up going on a call of duty, up, called up for duty and where do you go and, and how do you end up getting injured? So I, I had, I had just finished a tour in uh, Korea and then I headed off to, uh, Italy for my duty station. Mm hmm and when I, I had already been told before I got there that, hey, in August, we're, we're heading down range uh, for another, and we're going to be gone for about six, seven months. And I was like, all right, cool. But in my head, I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to tell my wife? You know, I was like, because before Korea, I just got back from Iraq. Mm -hmm. It's like, and I was gone for, I think, I want to say five, six months. Mm -hmm. And then, I, you know, I leave for uh, Korea. A few months after getting back, and now I'm headed to Afghanistan. So I'm like, how am I going to tell her this? Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, I had to figure out how to do it, and and, and I probably didn't do it the right way because I <laughs> waited till June to tell her, and I was leaving in August. Uh, but that situation, I, I, I tell that story because I, I want to help people. It's like, don't do the same thing I did. <laughs> Uh, cause you, you think that our plans will always work yeah. and, and they kind of do, but they kind of don't. And yeah. mine, luckily I have a great wife and understanding cause she was, I got lie, she was pissed at me. <laughs> you know, I knew since like December and I told oh, her, wow. to, uh, and I was using the Pope kind of to, you know, ease the tension. Cause I was like, well, I'll tell her from the Pope, she can't yell at me, you know? <laughs> Uh, but again, anyone that is Catholic knows that April of 2005, Pope John Paul II passed. So, oh, okay, that kind of ruined my my plans. <laughs> but but I remember, you know, we got into it because I tell her finally, like we're at the at the ruins by the Colosseum, and and I had my son with me in my arms like a shield just in case she attacked me. <laughs> I was like, sorry, buddy, you're going to be, you're going to take the blunt of this. Wow. <laughs> and I tell her and she doesn't yell at me. And I'm like, holy crap. In our heads, like most guys were like, yes, we're geniuses. We did it. <laughs> and we get back to the room, man. I, I, I say I saw devil face. Oh, and anyone that has a loved one knows that you see that face like, man, you're in trouble. <laughs> and we, we got into it. Like I said, we got into it and she actually, Gave me an ultimatum. Mm. She said, you need to get out or we're done. Wow. And it wasn't that she was being vindictive. It was because I always said I'll never let my son grow up without his dad. Mm -hmm. But yet my son was going to be turning three in August, and he probably knew me a total of maybe six months out of his life. Mm -hmm. So he was growing up without his dad. But luckily, you know, this is how great she is. She kind of put everything on the side and say, let me say, you know what? We'll talk about this later. Concentrate on being downrange. Hi, folks. Here's Foss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements. If you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff, uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO and be sure to check out Chris Voss leadership institute.com now back to the show mm -hmm. and so you know i headed out downrange in august and we're out there a couple months and when i get there at my five i'm the only jtech uh, joint terminal tech controller uh, to to cover two army companies an sf team and a scout team mm -hmm. and how it works they'll send us to wherever they think is going to be most dangerous where they're going to get troops in contact wow because we're the ones calling in the airstrikes. So I was out constantly. And it was right after Thanksgiving, we got orders. And I was told, hey, going out with the scouts, 
because uh, there's a high value target you guys got to capture kill and a supply route the Taliban was using and we had to destroy it. So we head out like I want to say December 1st, we air salted into this bow. I mean, we have mountains all around us and we, we air salted, they air salt our, or some vehicles on our dirt bikes and we go into our, and we take over to kind of this little compound and we do operations out of there. And we kept going, we were out there, nothing happened. And our, our interpreter all of a sudden, our, our interpreter keeps telling us, hey, these guys see us because he get, he's getting ICOM chatter. It's like they see us when we leave on foot. They see us when we leave on our bikes. They see us when we leave in the trucks. Because, again, we're in a boat. They're standing up on the mountains watching us. So our, our, our lieutenant, who was young, fresh out of uh, West Point, I mean, this is how green he was. He took a selfie or took a picture with him. Well, because I don't think we had selfies yet. But he had someone with a camera take a picture of him next to an IED. But we're like, what are you doing, dude? Holy shit. Uh, you know, but he, but that's the job of us as uh, as an NCO is to kind of shape that young lieutenant to eventually be a gr- a, gr- a great leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, like I said, they were, they they were seeing us. So he m- makes a plan. It's like, all right, guys, we're going to take half the scout team, which will be about ten of us, uh, and we're going to go out in two vehicles late afternoon, and half of that, so five guys, are going to go up on the mountain, stay overnight. Because try and capture the, the Taliban guys as they come up and, and, and watch us. And my team was going to be Overwatch. And we had been out there a couple of na- a couple of days and nothing. And the night prior, which was, you know, it, it, it's crazy because, you know, like almost like a calm before the storm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember I was, it was my turn to do my watch. So it was like two hours sleep, one hour watch. And it was the clearest, clearest night, man. I saw it. You can see every star out, you know, it, it's still, you know, I almost compare it to like when Forrest Gump talks about when in, in Vietnam, when it stopped raining, he could, uh, the clouds were open up and you'll see every star, mm-hmm. you know, that's how I felt. And the next morning, you know, we go out, we're doing our, you know, we, we get some ANA, some Afghani National Army, we go to hit this town, nothing really. And then our teammates are saying, hey, uh, we need to get resupplied because we already been out there like I want to say three days, and we're driving back. We're in the lead vehicle, and I remember crossing this creek, and no more two hundred meters after we cross this creek, do I feel an intense heat blast? Wow! And on the left side, and I was like, "Holy shit! We just I just got hit." Mm-hmm. It was and an ID. It was it was, it was an ID. Wow! And, and people talk you know, about how your life flashed in front of you. And I, and I never really believed that. But man, it, it, it went, when I got hit, it, it, it almost seemed like a movie reel where you see clips mm-hmm. of moments. Uh, but for me, it was like the most distinct ones were three, things that hadn't happened yet that were supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. Like one was me and my wife finally getting married by the church, wow. you know, after our third attempt, because every time I retired, we tried, I was deployed, uh, us honeymooning in Greece because that was her, that's where she always wanted to go. Mm-hmm. But the last one was me teaching my boy how to play ball because I'm a big ball player. Mm-hmm. And, and then something in my, my head clicks and says, you got to get out of this truck. And I popped the door. I, I come out. So was, when I came out, man, I was on fire from head to toe. Jesus. Uh, but I knew there was that creek behind me, so I turned, run to it. But the flames overtook me, and, and I collapsed, and I la- I'm laying there, and I'm thinking that I'm going to die here. That mm-hmm. I broke my promise to my family that I'll always come back. Wow! I broke my promise to my dad, to my son, that I'll never let him grow up without his dad like I did. But most importantly, I, I'm breaking my promise I made to my dad when I was 12 years old that that I always will take care of my family. That's. And, that's interesting that that moment you're still very selfless. You know, most people would be focused on themselves. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I just, that's all that was running through my mind was my family. Mm-hmm. And I promise, uh, you know, I, you know, I just wanted to be back for them. I just wanted to, you know, raise my boy. And then, you know, earlier I, I might've, you know, busted out on the LT, but I must've yelled out that I'm going to die here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he said, DT, you're not going to die here. And 
he throws some dirt on me, helps me up, and we both jump in the creek. And the sound that I heard was the same sound as when you put a hot pan in cold water. Jesus. That sizzle sound. And the LT jumped in too, because when he helped me, I, I lit him on fire. And I was like, sorry, dude, can't really control flames, you know. Uh, and I look at him, and I'm like, dude, this sucks. And he's like, are you trying to be funny? DT? He's like, no, sir, I, I just got blown up. I was on fire, had to jump on a freezing cold creek in December in Afghanistan. This sucks. And for me, I don't know if it was me subconsciously just calm the situation down. Because as soon as I got hit, my guys on mountain, they're getting hit with a crossfire. Now they're calling back wow. for gunslinger, which mm-hmm. is my, was my call sign. Because it, it's like, we need cast, we need close air support. So I had to figure out what to do. You know, yes, I was, I'm Air Force, but, you know, they're my Army brothers. They're my family. I have to honor, again, that promise to my dad, wow. take care of your family. So I had to figure out what to do. You know, my radios that I had were destroyed. Mm-hmm. My backup radios were in the truck that got destroyed. And I remember the medic trying to take care of me. It's like, dude, dude, I'm okay. It's like, just cut off my, my we call them uh, Ranger panties. The little mm-hmm. running starts. I had them underneath because the elastic was burning me. Yeah. I was like, it's, take care of, of Bailey. He was our gunner. He got blown out and, and the truck had ran over his legs. Jesus. Uh, it's like, so I had to figure out what to do. Uh, luckily, one of the other scout uh, guys had a radar con mm-hmm. And I tell him, hey, man, get on this frequency, re- repeat everything I say. So we can get some help here to our guys. Jesus. So by the last transmit, the, by the last transmission that went out after he was repeating everything I said, uh, I guess that's when the adrenaline started going down. I started having a hard time breathing mm-hmm. and I started to get scared. You know, I, I, I tell people as, as much as I want to tell people I, I was like Rambo that I had no fear. Mm-hmm. It was like, I got scared. And your body's probably starting to go into shock at that point. Going into right? shock. I'm tired. I was like, I want to sleep. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember telling our medicine, hey, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to lay down. Let me close my eyes for a second. Wow. But he knew if he let me fall asleep, he would, I would never wake up again. How bad were the burns across your body? Well, for me, I looked at myself as like my legs hurt, uh, but I really didn't feel anything. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I looked at myself like, okay. I got a little blood, on my, like I said, from my leg, on my left leg, uh, but I had all my all, all my body parts. So I'm like, okay, I'm good. Uh, I was like, figure, okay, I probably got my eyebrows and hair singed, but well, that's the worst of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, he knew I was a lot worse than I thought. The medic did, and he just tried to keep me up, trying to find things to, you know, fight for, trying to find my spark, mm-hmm. and. You know, he was, you know, he was using everything he could. He was thinking, come on, man, fight for your wife or fight, fight for your wife. And, you know, I tell him, I was like, man, try something else. That ain't going to happen. That ain't going to work. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He didn't say that. I was like, throw some jazz. You were getting a little too serious. I was, a, I was a, yeah, I was a, you're, you're getting too serious. You got me on this. that one. You got me on that one. <laughs> uh, but he knew that I, I had lost my dad while I was young. And so he, He's, and I said, I will never let that happen to my son. So he used that. He's like, come oh, on, wow. DT, fight for your son. You wow. said you'll never let him grow up without his dad like you. Fight for your son. Because I tell people, we all have a spark mm-hmm. that drives us, that keeps us going. And sometimes you can find out your own, and sometimes you need help. And, 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 and the medic knew that my son was my spark. And so he's making me yell it, you know, the top of my lungs, you know, wow. there. There's Sergeant Del Toro, you know, you know, butt naked, uh, yelling that I got to fight for my son. And then he says the weirdest thing. Uh, he's like, DT, fight for your son so you can teach him to be a pimp. <laughs> and I'm like, did he really just say that? And he, he repeats it again. So, again, there I am, yelling at the top of my lungs, you know, naked in Afghanistan, saying I got to fight for my son to teach him to be a pimp. It sounds like Saturdays around my place. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, it worked. Because yeah. you, use, you use whatever you can to keep your teammate motivated, keep them yeah. alive. 
Yeah. And because it kept me up, it kept me going until that the helicopter medevac arrived. And I remember they wanted to carry me to the helicopter. And I was like, oh, hell no. I was like, I walked into this fight. I'm going to walk out. Mm-hmm. And, and and I hobbled my my naked butt to the helicopter and I'm laying there thinking, oh my God, I could finally relax and get some good drugs in me, you know. And I remember the flight in and out. I remember landing at our, our FOB, uh, them taking me into our little field hospital and seeing some of my uh, rest of my Air Force teammates and Army teammates and the duck cutting off my watch, the doctor, mm-hmm. and then telling me, you're going to be okay. And that was December 4th, 05. I wake up March of 06. Wow. So did you go into a coma? Did they put you in yeah, a coma? Yeah, they put me in a coma. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and it's crazy being in a coma because it doesn't really hit you until a year after. Oh, really? Yeah, because I, I, like I said, I, I'm a big baseball guy, I'm a big ball player. You know, I, I remember watching, uh, you know, just I probably was like January of 2007. Mm-hmm. And I'm watching ESPN, and I hear it's the one-year anniversary of Kirby Puckett's death. And I'm like, when did Kirby Puckett die? I was like, oh, it was when I was in a coma. But that's when it really hits you. It's like, oh, my God, anything that happened within those four months when I was in a coma, I have no memory of. Wow. So you anything need to go back and watch CNN for four months. <laughs> <laughs> put put <see> the coma. <laughs> something, yeah, something. I don't know. <laughs> Catch up on like here. Here's what happened in your life. So you you have to go through a lot of rehab, right? And what's that journey like coming back? Is does your just keeping your word and your promise be the thing that helps you fight and and be the spark to 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 make you carry on? Uh, what help What helped me a lot? Yes, that 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 promise was a big part. Uh, and, but having my family and my friends there when I wake up, uh, and then me wanting to be with my son, uh, cause when I woke up, you know, obviously they ask you the normal questions. You, do you know where you're at? I was mm-hmm. like, nah, I don't know. Like Germany. It's like, no, you're in San Antonio. Wow. You know, the date, uh, December something, uh, 2005. It's like, no, it's March of 06. Uh, and then, you know, after that, they start telling you what had happened to you, Jeez. you know, how you, you almost died three times. Wow. You know, we gave you a 15% chance to survive. 15%. Wow. 80% of your body has third degree burns. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you're awake now, but you still got a long recovery. Jesus. You know, you're going to be here for another year and a half. Uh, and you'll be on a respirator for the rest of your life. Uh, you may not walk again. And your mm-hmm. military career is pretty much over. Jesus. Uh, and I remember them kind of waiting for my response because I, I couldn't move because all my, my muscles atropine. Mm-hmm. I was all bandaged up. And I started seeing that, okay, I'm missing digits now on my fingers, not my hands, I mean. And, and I couldn't talk because I had a trach. And they're waiting. So they're just reading my lips. And I pretty much told them, you can kiss my ass. I'm not gonna accept that. I, you know, I just, I never, I never accepted anyone tell me what my life was gonna be. You know, you I, a kid growing up on the bad side of town with no parents. Statistically, I should have been a gangbanger drug dealer. I was neither. You know, when I was graduating high school, you know, I remember my counselor saying, "You should go to a community college." Which nothing wrong with community college, but I wanted to go to University of Illinois. And then getting a full academic scholarship and slamming it on my counselor's desk and telling them to F off, you know, I should, probably should have thought that through because my counselor was a, I went to a Catholic high school. So it, my counselor was a, a priest. You're but going that, to hell now. That, that month of detention was worth it though. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, your so, attitude. So, so why would I going to accept now what these doctors say my life is going to be? I was mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to let this, this define me. I'm going to define who I am. And, there you go. and I also, I want to show my son that dad's going to beat this. Yeah. Plus you need to make him a pimp. So I has that, has that turned out yet? Are you still working on that? I'm still working on it. He's, is, the, is the wife going along with that? My wife's not very good along with that. She doesn't it's like our son would not be a pimp. <laughs> but, but most of all, man, you know, I, I really want to 
show those SOBs that left that bomb there, that thing going to ruin my life, man. Wow. I'm still going to continue. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong. It was hard. Learning to walk again is hard. But the worst of it, most people don't understand when you're, when you're severely burned, your, your skin becomes hypersensitive. So, so like this, my hand right here, mm -hmm. you could have rubbed a feather across it mm -hmm. and it felt like you were cutting me with razor blades. Oh, wow. But you have desensitized or you can't touch anything mm -hmm. and then get stretched, you know, so you, you, you don't get you that elasticity of, of your, your joints. And mm -hmm. it was some of the worst pain and, but I knew I had to go through it. I, I had it if I wanted to get better, if I wanted to be independent, I had to go through it. So every day going to therapy, I remember it would change. Stick your hands in, in and like, like pebbles, stick it, rub it against the carpet and sand, you know, some mm -hmm. of the most tense pain a human could go through. Uh, but I, again, I had to do it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted to see my boy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have bad days. Who's not going to have a bad day? I went from a 200 pound muscle head to 115 pounds. I, I was frail, scared, tiny. Mm -hmm. I, I looked like a podcast host. <laughs> not me, because I'm a big heavy. I'm a big heavy podcast host. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, who's not going to have a bad day? Mm -hmm. uh, but I had friends there by my side who helped me get over those bad days. So I wouldn't just dwell in that darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, so once I started getting better, uh, you know, two months after they gave me that diagnosis, I left that hospital. Walking wow. and breathing on my own. Two months. <laughs> two months. Wow. And I, but when I got out, man, you know, I still had a long, long journey to go, you know, yeah. most people think this face is, is what I looked like when I came out. I was like, no, nah, this is, this is hundreds. A procedure is done on me. Wow. Uh, but I, I, but what I saw while I was in the hospital, yeah, like I said, I miss being with my teammates. Mm -hmm. I miss being downrange with them. But I saw all these wounded guys mm -hmm. as my brothers now. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I was wounded, but I was still an NCO in, in the Air Force. And the duty of an NCO is to take care of his troops and make things better for them, even though they may never see the benefits of it. Wow. And, and became a big advocate for them and, and, and spoke for them. And there was time maybe I should have used a, be, a little bit more tack, but sometimes I was, I was like, fuck it. I was like, I, I had to do what I'd had to do to take care of my guys. There you go. And you become an inspiration for a lot of people. Uh, President Biden is uh, one of the endorsers on your book. Uh, President George W. Bush, uh, George Stewart, I think, if I recall right. rightly. Um, you, you start speaking and inspiring people and, and using your hero's journey to to inspire others. And at some point, you decide you want to re-enlist. And I guess that's not a very big thing with the, with the military. Yeah, you know, for me, people kept asking me, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. I was like, I want to continue serving. And, and they were like, why, DT? You're starting to get very good at public speaking, and they pay well. And yes, they do. You know, some people for 45 minutes can make, you know, 50 grand, mm -hmm. like nothing. And some of the higher ends can make 100, you know, 100 grand. Yeah. But I used to tell them, like, there's thousands of people hundreds of thousands of people are that out there that make amazing money and hate their job. That's true. <laughs> so why am I going to give up my job for some money when I love doing what I, I love being a techie. I love being in the air force. I love for my, serve my country. Mm -hmm. So why am I going to give that up for a couple bucks? There and so go. I thought it took, I want to say, you know, to five years. Wow. To show that I still had value. Yes. Could I be an operator, be downrange? No, unless we become like Star Wars and I get a cool Luke Skywalker hand and use the Jedi mind trick on people, but we're not there. But I knew I could teach because my mind was there. Mm -hmm. I could get the next generation of operators going. And But, you know, the biggest thing uh, that was holding me back was lawyers, lawyers for the military. Really? They, wow. but again, luckily I had people in my corner. I, I talk about Mr. Mr. Beckett and Mr. Myers. Mm -hmm. 
uh, who helped me a lot, you know, you know, the, the lawyers had said that, you know, well, okay, yes, yeah, Arnold Toro's getting stronger. He's able to do a lot of things, but he can never deploy again. Mm-hmm. So Mr. Mr. Myers researched. He's like, okay, you're saying this guy who has deployed multiple times can't stay in because he can't deploy anymore. But yet, at the time, I, I would say it was like 68% of the Air Force never deploys. Mm-hmm. And you're saying he can't stay in. And that was it. The lawyer's like, okay, got it. And, wow. and I remember going to my med board and the doc, the, them telling me, okay, Sergeant Del Toro, here are your options. You're 100% disabled, full medical retirement out of the mm-hmm. military. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm expecting that. It's like, here's option two. 100% disabled, uh, able to re enlist in the Air Force and become an instructor. And I was like, yes, I'll take it. And they're like, hold on, wait, wait. I was like, option three. I'm like, what the hell? What what other options are there? And he's like, 100% disabled, medically retired, come back as a GS-11 civilian instructor. And oh, civilian. Civilian. Meaning GS-11, you know, you're making like, I don't know, like 80000 or above plus. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I was not expecting that. Mm-hmm. And this was like right before Christmas, like a week before Christmas. And they, and I asked them, how long do I have to decide? Because I wasn't expecting that. Mm-hmm. And they're like, you got after the Christmas break to let us know. So I went home, asked, talked to a couple of mentors, and they all said the same things. Like, DT, you know what you're going to do. And I was like, why are you wasting our time calling us? And they, yeah, they were right. I knew. I, the next day, I was like, I'm staying in. I was like, I'm realistic. Wow. And on February 2010, that's when I became the first 100% disabled airman the, to re-enlist in the Air Force. The first airman with a 100% disability rating to be allowed to re-enlist. That is powerful, man. And to want to go back and help people and serve your country and, and serve others. And, and as you say, you know, keep your promise, keep your word. Um, that, that just is a masterful uh, standing of character in my mind. No, I appreciate that, Chris. It's just, there you go. I love my job, man. I, I didn't want to give it up. Why am I going to want to give it up? That's true. Plus, you know, like you mentioned earlier, those guys in Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, uh, they don't they don't get to win. You win in the end. Right. That is very true. You know, I did. I showed them that my, my, my disability, my injury was not going to define me. I was going to define who I am. And that's what I've been doing since then. And, you know, that inspiration speaks to what a lot of people uh, need in life. You know, we all go through trauma. We all go through uh, disappointments. Things don't work out. Failures. uh, Lots of things can come at us at life. But taking that attitude of this isn't going to define who I am and I'm going to control who I am is very powerful and uh, and, uh, empowering, giving you you, uh, a reason to keep going. Yeah, it, it does. You know, for me, it's still, even when, you know, you earlier when you introduced me and said we're going to speak to a hero, it, I don't see myself like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it still feels weird. It's like I'm just regular DT who likes to hang out with his friends, you know, you know, drink some, you know, whiskey, you know, play some Call of Duty. You know, yeah, it takes me a little longer to put my pants on, but, you know, I'm still the same guy. You know, I don't see myself in that light. It for me, it didn't really hit me that how my words, my story impact people until this one event was I was speaking to the whole base on, on McGuire, uh, which uh, which is in New Jersey, uh, an Air Force base there. And I give my I, I give I tell my, my speech and I usually open it for question and answer. And some people will ask me things, some people will wait till where they're shaking my hand, asking me, you know, ask me a question, or even they'll wait and and message me on, on on social media or you know direct message me and ask me. But this time there's this young young lady, uh, she was an A1C, meaning she was probably in two years. Mm-hmm. Stands up and says, Sandro Toro, I have tried to kill myself many times. Jesus, wow! But I hear how you never gave up how you kept going, you know, to, to be there for your family, to, to honor your dad's promise. You have helped me find my spark. You have helped me find value to continue fighting. 
And I just want to thank you for that. And for me, it, it just hit me. I was like, for, for this young lady to stand up in front of her leadership mm-hmm. and say that this is when it hit me. It's like, my God, my, my, my story do, do impact people. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and again, I'm, I'm a realist, man. I know I'm not going to affect, touch everybody out there. Mm-hmm. But those one or two that really need to hear, like that young lady that I just said, all that pain, all that suffering I went through in my life was worth it because she found her spark and she still found the will to live and fight. There you go. And and that's where you're going to make the biggest difference. And I'm sure you inspire a lot of people. I remember we had somebody on the show, uh, an author a couple of years ago, and I was in the midst of my book and, and the editing part. You know how fun that part is, right? <laughs> and uh, I was complaining after the show to her, and she, you know, she was a multi-book author. And she says, I'm going to tell you something. There's somebody out there that needs your book. There's somebody out there that needs your story that you're going to tell that's going to change their life and inspire them. You may never meet them. You may never know them, but they need you to finish that book. And so if you, if you can't finish it for yourself, you do it for them. And so I'm sure a lot of people are going to read your book. Your story is going to be amplified even more to more people, and you're going to help a lot more people be inspired and, and uh, find their spark in life. Oh, I appreciate that, Chris. And you know, you're, you're helping me do that. You know, me, being, being allowed to be on your podcast and talk about this and my journey, you know, hopefully it does. Cause at, at the end, you know, I just want to be able to not only honor my dad, but to be out there and to help people on their darkest times and help them find their spark. Cause I never, I th- I had to have people help me during my dark times and let me do that for them. And if my story does that. Then, then I, I'm, I'm honoring my dad as the best as I can. There you go. Keeping, uh, excuse me, and keeping your word, you know, finding for your life. I mean, people, this is, I'm sure that maybe that young lady, you know, she needed to find, uh, you know, keeping a word to yourself, keeping your word to others and uh, making, having that empowerment, if you will. So anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go? Uh, Well, I know now for my, I guess I would say, those who have heard me speak, I will say, you know, you can only go into detail in an hour or so. You really can't hit, but with, I wanted in my book to be more in detail, kind of know more of the little journeys that I went through mm-hmm. and how I felt and, and the journey like uh, my wife, because I wanted to include her journey when I got hurt and mm-hmm. what she had to go through. Because we like to think that you know, when, when we in situations like that, the, the family is together, but a lot of time it's not. Yeah. There's bickering, there's fighting. And, and I wanted to show that, that mm-hmm. even myself, you know, even though when I thought it didn't happen, it did happen. Yeah. Uh, and my wife just didn't want to tell me. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, it, it might, this book goes into a lot more detail and, 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 and hopefully it helps, you know, seeing all those little details where, you know, I do have those bad days, how me waking up every morning, I may not show it hurts. Yeah. I still keep getting up and going, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I just hope people and really enjoy it. Uh, you know, it, it, I, someone did ask me the last time, like one of my friends, it's like, how's it going? How do you feel about this whole book thing? And I and I said it's like you know honestly, right now it's more of a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you know she's like she's like you know like well DT think of it like a pregnancy. I was like huh? <laughs> well you know you're you're in this labor and then once that that book's out like a baby's out you're all that joy is mm-hmm. and I was like you know what, Brandy, I'll let you use that analogy. <laughs> Because if I try and say that, not only are my friends going to bust my chops, but all my female friends are going to like, are you really comparing your uh, release <laughs> to a pregnancy? Yeah, you, can, you know, it might be real bad. Which, which I, I, I understand. I, I, I get it. I get how where she's trying to go, but I'll let you say that to other people. You know, I'll just tell the story how you wanted me to use it. <laughs> 
<laughs> there you go. Well, July 4th, your book will be out. And I, I guarantee you, being an author is pretty damn cool. Like, people people look at you differently. Like, uh, most people would never talk to me or have anything to do with me. And now at least one person will talk to me. So, <laughs> but it, well, it's it's kind of cool. Well, Chris, people look differently at me, at me all the time. So, you know. <laughs> Well, they'll, they'll, you'll just, I mean, it's like an added badge of honor. I think, the, I think the challenge is it's so hard to write a book and get it published and go through the editing process. It's so hard that when you finally do it, people just go, you know, you get an extra medal of regalia where, you know, people are like, well, this guy must be smart. He wrote a book. <laughs> you know? well, I always like, we're like, so what did, what did it take like three or four months to do a book? I'm like, yeah, I, I wish dude. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. I was like, I turned in the script like a year ago. Yeah, it did the the big. I think you did it with Harper and Harper Collins, our friends over there. They, I mean, they take like a long year between just just from the time you write it to publish right. it, you know. But they do a great job. So it's been an honor to have you on. I called you here earlier, and in my book, and I hope a lot of people's books. Um, any uh, American who uh, defends our country. Uh, and enlists and puts their, I mean, they're putting their life on the line when they enlist. They don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whether they're going to go to war. I was just reading Mattis's book. I think it was, I think it was Call Sign Chaos was the name yes. of it. And, um, and, uh, you know, when people enlist, they, they don't know whether they're going to go to war and it's, it's come what may. And they're, they're putting their lives on the line for freedom, our country, and this 200, almost 50 year old experiment that we're kind of still mucking through and, trying to form a perfect union and probably always will be trying to form it. But thank you very much for your service, sir. No, thank you, Chris. And thank you for me having me on here. And, and I, I really do hope you enjoyed the book. I, I, we will. And uh, I hope people pick it up and read it, share it and learn some things about keeping their word, keeping their promise. We need more of that in this world that uh, these things matter and that uh, there's a higher calling or higher purpose, wherever you want to, whatever you want to call that, but a, a higher purpose to ourselves and everything else. So thank you very much for coming on the show. I certainly appreciate it, DT. All right, thanks, Chris. There you go. And thanks, my honest, for tuning in. Order up the book wherever fine books are sold. Stay away as alleyway bookstores. Uh, you might run into uh, DT's uh, pimp son. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't do that. I'm sure your wife loves that story. Uh, <laughs> uh, a Patriot's Promise. Protecting my brothers, fighting for my life, and keeping my word. I highly recommend you pick it up. It'll be available July 4th, 2023, which I think is the birthday of these uh, these things we call America. America. <laughs> America. <laughs> there you go. You got to love it. Thanks for tuning in, my audience. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, and follow us on TikTok. We started putting Brett, Captain Brett Crozier's uh stories up there uh what an amazing journey he went on he was the gentleman who ran the he's captain of theodore roosevelt and right. uh when um he had to uh, resign from his uh duty there was relieved of his thing over the COVID thing his shipmates or his shipmates his shipmen uh <laughs> and women underneath him they chanted his name and gave him a standing ovation as he walked up the ship it's quite the inspiring story if you remember it right. so uh, just a wonderful story. Thanks for tuning in to my audience. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.